video games that are so lifelike that some young people have a difficult time trying to distinguish between virtual reality and actual reality. It raises some interesting questions. Outside of fun, what is the appeal for many to get enmeshed in these games and worlds? Is this trend towards virtual or alternate realities a good thing, a bad thing, or just a thing? What questions should we be asking that perhaps we're not asking enough or at all? At one time, the hashtag YOLO was very popular. So if we only live once, should we be free to live this life however we want to? Even if part of living this life isn't actually living this life. Stay tuned until the end. If this is your first time here, make sure and hit that subscribe button so that you never miss a video or an interview. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. On Reddit, one person wrote, A lot of people, when referring to interactions with others online, will say that this wasn't an IRL conversation rather than in person. Even if you're speaking to someone online, that doesn't mean it's not in real life. Just wondering why people say that over in person. Is conversing with someone online an entirely different dimension and not part of reality? Someone responds, this comes from MMORPG games, whatever that means. There was a difference between things happening in game and in real life. People lived separate lives, one slaying monsters, one filling spreadsheets. When you said let's meet at the pub, you had to specify if it was John, Desk Jockey, or Tagnar, level 57 warrior that would appear at the Crown down the street or at the Goldshire Inn. It's stuck out of context. It's a generalization in my opinion. It's like saying I'm laughing IRL in real life. Saying I'm laughing in person just sounds weird and kind of makes no sense. IRL or in real life and in person just don't correlate. There's different meanings. Now one meaning of in real life is intended to convey I saw or experienced this happening personally. It can also mean, obviously, that this happened temporally and in the material world. It wasn't fantasy, it wasn't make-believe. But the phrase ultimately exists to denote the difference between the life we live in the real material world with other real people and the life we can live in some sort of virtual world, whether in a video game or a virtual reality simulation. With the advent of VR and AI, we have and will have an even more nuanced understanding of of what used to be a relatively common sense expression in real life. But now, the lines between physical reality and virtual reality are getting blurred more and more. On one hand, it makes perfect sense that if someone has a lack of clarity on how to live this life, they would long to change their life, perhaps multiple times, in order to fit what they believe their reality should look like. But this is a bit like trying to put together the furniture without seeing the picture on the front of the box first. Sure, you might still get some parts out of place, but at least you'll be able to tell when you're doing it wrong. See, a knowledge of the purpose of life, and broadly speaking, is to know Christ and make him known, allows one to enjoy and accept the realness of this life while looking forward to the continuation of life with God himself. But not knowing why one is here in real life can cause angst, uncertainty, impulsive decision making, and fear of the unknown. And those are not the prerequisites for a long, purpose-filled life. In a book on hermeneutics teaching us how to study the Bible properly, Duvall and Hayes say this about what happens when we properly understand and apply the principles and directives found throughout Scripture. They write, this completes our approach to applying the meaning of the Bible. Because God's character and human nature do not change, his word remains relevant. Our principalizing approach gives you a way to grasp the Bible's relevance for every generation. Not only for us, but also for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and so on. Some of you might be concerned that this method will restrict your freedom to apply the scriptures. We remind you that as faithful readers, our job is not to invent new meaning, but to apply the meaning that has been inscribed in the biblical text. Don't worry, 
you'll be able to find a number of parallel situations in your life or in your world that do contain all the key elements. And when you find a genuine parallel, you can be confident that you are applying the real meaning of the biblical text. Also, don't be afraid to make your applications specific by creating real world scenarios or by contemporizing a biblical story. People need illustrations and examples of how the meaning might be lived out in real life. God wants his word to sink deep into our hearts and minds and transform the way we live. You see, what it seems is that we need a guide, something or someone to help us live out this real life with real effectiveness and real purpose. Now, I do believe that the AI and VR designers have one thing correct. There does seem to be a desire to escape this life to somehow enter something closer to utopia or to be in a world where we can control all of the resources or situations. And many games provide some type of experience like this. But there's some questions that remain. Why aren't we as comfortable in our environment as the animals are in theirs? Why do we need to make it better? Why do we work so hard to reduce evil and its effects? Why do we search for a world and a life that is not currently real, but we may hope could one day be? Well, for those who may not know, there is something of a utopia to which we can go. And although it is very real, it is not real for us now. But our longing gives us a clue. Scripture clarifies and codifies that clue. The scriptural narrative is true and beautiful. Archaeology, Historical research, extra biblical evidence all affirm the truth of the actions of the people recorded in scripture as well as many of the dictates and truths outlined in scripture. In her amazing book, The Jesus Storybook Bible, Sarah Lloyd-Jones writes, Now some people think the Bible is a book of rules, telling you what you should and shouldn't do. The Bible certainly does have some rules in it. They show you how life works best. But the Bible isn't mainly about you and what you should be doing. It's about God and what he has done. Other people think the Bible is a book of heroes, showing you people you should copy. The Bible does have some heroes in it, but as you will soon find out, most of the people in the Bible aren't heroes at all. They make some big mistakes, sometimes on purpose. They get afraid and run away. At times, they're downright mean. No, the Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the ones he loves. It's like the most wonderful of fairy tales that has come true in real life. You see, the best thing about this story is it's true. And a recognition of this truth, the truth, makes even this imperfect life on earth much more beautiful and fulfilling than it could be on our own. The key to living this life on earth faithfully and fully is by keeping in mind that this life is not the realest life we will live. To be clear, I'm not saying that what we see as real isn't real, I'm not saying we're living in the matrix or anything like that, but perhaps it isn't all that is real. See, as finite humans, we have created alternate realms through virtual reality, some games, some internet-based alternate realities. So why should we balk at the idea of an even more profound alternate reality created by an even more profound being, God? And because God is real, whatever he actualizes is the most real things that there are. God knew this world would be real but also imperfect. And the scriptures are not shy about that. One writer writes, why do you enjoy Psalms? Is it because this book leads you into a deeper worship of God? Is it the wonderful imagery and powerful figures of speech? Perhaps it is because the Psalms have a way of connecting to real life situations and of reflecting a refreshing honesty that we in real life situations can relate to. In many contemporary pious Christian circles, believers are discouraged from expressing doubt, despair, and pain in public. Apparently, the assumption is that such emotions are reflective of immature faith. The psalmists, by contrast, do not hesitate from expressing a wide variety of emotions. They come right out and express what bothers them. So we have no need to run from the pain and pressures of this life. 
and more importantly, they're inescapable anyway. So our best bet is to find God's truth through those times. Some people may think that this is nothing to worry about or address. The fact that people want to escape reality from time to time to enter a world that they can control and may even be of their own making, it's not a big deal. And I hope you're right. However, Rebecca Rosen wrote in an article for The Atlantic in which she brought this issue to the forefront. She writes, I confess to using the acronym IRL in real life on occasion to draw a distinction between my life online and my life offline, the real one. But this has always seemed like a false distinction. My online life feels real. I have real conversations with friends, real emotions while looking at old pictures and real laughs from funny videos or sites. What about this isn't real? In the video below, Canadian social media theorist Alexandra Samuel calls on us to give up this idea that what happens online is not real. Rather, she says, when you're online, you're often more real, more authentic than you would be offline. We take our online lives more seriously and recognize that other people online are real too, we can build a more empathetic, thoughtful, and interesting internet, she says. If we are our most real selves online as opposed to in person, something has gone drastically wrong. We were built for community, in person and face-to-face -face community. And of course, this may not always be possible or be possible for the entirety of a day, but it should be a goal that we have within our lives. If we are our most real selves online, that only entices all of us who want to be real to be online. We all know that if we've learned nothing else through this internet and social media age is that people are bigger liars online than in real life, more likely to be antagonistic online than in real life, more hateful online than in real life, and more arrogant about the information they think they know online rather than in real life. And even if you or I are not those things online, all of us are extremely judgmental online. Don't say you aren't. Therefore, one of two things can be true. Either we are at our core hateful, arrogant, and antagonistic, or we are not our realest selves while online. And if we're not our realest, truest selves online, that means who we are in person is our realest self. And if you don't like the person that you are in real life, you can become a new person. It will just look a little different than you expected. The good news is it won't require any surgery or pills of any kind. You won't be an avatar or anything like that. You won't have extraordinary strength or you won't have any superpowers, but you will be a new creation of sorts. The Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I can't tell you how many times people tell me, man, you don't look like that's what you used to do, or you don't look like that's how you, who you used to be, or you don't look like you used to do X, Y, and Z. You're like a new person from who you used to be. And all I do is simply smile. See, this inward change won't give you a brand new body yet, but the inward change will have outward manifestations for all who know you, to see and witness. My former life was imbued with a desire for pleasure, legal and illegal, and I'm not the only one. Many people simply desire pleasure and happiness and whatever will attain those things, they say do it. This may mean escaping reality for a few hours a day, but in the end, the price tag for an unreal life of pleasure is too much to bear. With regards to Solomon, a son of King David, who many consider the wisest and richest king to ever live, Akin writes, here's the point. He outdid anything we could ever do. Solomon had more and did more than anyone before him. He indulged in every desire and saw it as the reward for all his efforts. He concluded that everything was meaningless. He did not gain anything and simply was trying to grab wind. Even though he played out every one of his fantasies in real life, nothing fulfilled. We think to ourselves that we just need more and he says, no, you can accumulate more money, stuff and partners, but it will not matter. Nothing brings meaning. If that is true for him, what hope do we have? When will you be happy? In your mind, you say, I will be happy when blank. What would you put in the blank? Listen to Solomon 
through the spirit, it will not work. You think, if I could just have the American dream, everything would be different and I would be happy, but when you get it, you're not happy. It is all fleeting and does not satisfy. The state championship, the raise, the new car, the big house, they all fade. The cry of this generation is do not repress your desires because that is dangerous and leads to depression and maybe even suicide. No matter what your desire is, whether it has to do with gender identity, sexual orientation, pleasure, or dreams, do not repress them. Solomon lovingly warns us that indulging in whatever feels good is dangerous. You may get all you ever wanted, but you will not want it when you get it. It will not satisfy. God loves you, and he knows indulging under the sun leads to brokenness. Pleasure is not bad, but because of the fall, it cannot be our final guide. It cannot be ultimate. Pleasure is a good thing that if turned into a God thing, becomes an enslaving thing. So if foolish hedonism does not work, then maybe living the right kind of life will, right? I think we should all heed the warnings of a man who indulged in the heights of earthly pleasures when he tells us that these things are not ultimately real and do not ultimately satisfy. And for those that have entered a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you have caught yourself looking for or longing for an escape from this world, it's coming. But until then, you and I have a purpose to fulfill and we need to be consistent and constant in practices that will aid us in living this reality well. C.S. Lewis wrote, that is why daily prayers and religious readings and church going are necessary parts of the Christian life. We have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Neither this belief nor any other will automatically remain alive in the mind. It must be fed. And so the question is, are you feeding yourself the things that will help you to maximize this reality? Or are you spending too much time engaging in things that will help you to escape this real life? But I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. What do you think when you hear someone use the expression in real life or you see the hashtag IRL? And how do you differentiate between when to engage in activities that help escape the reality of this world and when to dive more deeply into it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. And until next time, peace.